Good morning again, everyone. I'm grateful for your sharing your family, your apartment, your, your togetherness uh, with St. Matthew today. Whether you are viewing from here in Baltimore or from around the country, or maybe even from around the world, we are grateful for your presence and your sharing in the life of faith and our prayer together today. Today, June 28th, is the 15th Sunday we've been live streaming. We've been doing this for 15 weeks. So I know it's a, a difficult thing for many of us, and it's a struggle to kind of keep this going. We only have a couple of more weeks to do this before we return to in-church worship. But I uh, thank you for your tenacity and your forthright uh, uh, steadfastness of staying with this and working with this and uh, sending messages throughout the week to let us know what works and what doesn't and how appreciative you are of all the people that make this happen. So the sermon today is good news, as you know. In the first part of my sermon, you might have seen, uh, it was in the pastor's desk this week, and some people posted it online. You might have seen the first part of that. The second part developed later in the week, so you'll get the full thing today. Praise the Lord. So uh, two weeks ago, on June the 15th, the Supreme Court ruled that a landmark civil rights law protecting gay, lesbian, and transgender people from discrimination in employment and that was the ruling from the Supreme Court. This was a long-awaited decision by the court that brought much relief and protection to the gay community. This weekend today, June the 28th, is the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall riots in Greenwich Village, Manhattan, New York. The police raided the Stonewall Inn, which was known as a gay bar, and has done many times before. But on this night, June the 28th, 1969, the patrons fought back. The conflict lasted for several days. This was the beginning of the gay pride movement, the gay liberation awareness, and gay liberation theology. One year later, in 1970, was the first gay pride parade. This year, 2020, is the 50th anniversary of the gay pride parade. So it is remarkable that during Pride Month 2020, on the 50th anniversary of the gay pride parade, that the Supreme Court would make such a ruling to end discrimination against gay, lesbian, and transgender people in employment. So, now why am I talking about this? Why would I recount all this news in a regular Sunday Catholic Church sermon? Well, actually, because the readings today, the first reading talks about hospitality, and the second reading talks about becoming who you are as a child of God, and the Gospel reading talks about welcoming, as you welcome uh, the followers of Christ and those who bring the word of Christ to you. The gospel also talks about the fact that if you take the gospel seriously, you may end up being divided from family members or friends. Jesus says that this is the cross. Now the preaching of the gospel is not an easy task. It comes with burdens. The preacher knows this. When Jesus talks about the cross now, he's not talking about, you know, a temporary inconvenience. The cross in Jesus' day was an instrument of torture and fear and horror. So Jesus making this comparison is making an incredible demand of his disciples. That is why the last line of the gospel says, to give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. Jesus is saying that those who live and preach the gospel at some point are going to need some relief because it's not an easy task. So when the preacher talks about issues that are unpopular, or issues that challenge the powers that be, the preacher knows that it's not on all going to be a smooth journey. However, the gospel still calls us to be hospitable and welcoming to those that are marginalized and those that are discriminated against in society and in the church. The church is the place where we are called to be hospitable and welcoming to all. This is the good news. Preaching is, to, is an attempt to transform the way people see things. The church where we gather is our training ground where the gospel is our teacher. And we will need these gifts throughout our lives. And the reason that we reach out to all with a welcoming, hospitable attitude is that the marginalized are going to save the church one day. One day the church itself will realize this. Women, gays, immigrants, youth, blacks, Latinos, anyone who's ever been maligned or discriminated against by the church is going to one day end up saving the church, praise the Lord. Why? 
because Jesus says the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. With all these different people coming to church, and especially here at St. Matthew and Blessed Sacrament, the different people we have coming to our churches, diversity is obligated, not optional. Diversity in the church is obligated, not optional. Besides, many of these marginalized folks have not left the church. Can you believe that? But have looked for ways to continually be a part of the church and society. I mean, after you've been marginalized or maligned or put down or told you don't belong, if you still stay in the church and want to become a faithful child of God and be in the church, the church really needs to learn from this type of spirituality, this type of strength, this type of tenacity. I mean, the church needs to be the place where we shout out, like Moses did, or like Dr. King did, let my people go. And even in the abuse crisis that we've heard about for years and years and years is the symbolic forms of other abuse in the church. And it was all kept secret. You know the abuse crisis was kept secret many ways, but so was racism and the structure of the church kept secret. Uh, so was treatment of women kept secret. So was treatment of gays kept secret. All of that was kept secret in certain times and certain ways while the gospel was saying we must be a hospitable, welcoming, be-who-you-are kind of church. Even in Poland recently, Jewish leaders told the Polish government not to dehumanize the LGBTQ plus community because they said that's how the Holocaust started and the extermination of the Jewish people began when they were first dehumanized. In Poland, there's a great anti-LGBT movement, and the Jewish leaders in Poland are standing against that movement because we understand when you dehumanize somebody, you begin to lower them in your own eyes so that you can exterminate them. And this process also happened in Rwanda in the genocide. You know that. The Tutsi tribe was dehumanized. People in Rwanda called the Tutsi tribe cockroaches because what do you want to do with a cockroach? Step on it, crush it, and get it out of your house. And that's what they said about the Tutsi tribe. They were dehumanized first, and that made it easier to exterminate them. When that process begins, we have to be careful of the language we are using. The Jewish leaders told the Polish politicians that stirring up fear of minority groups leads to tragedy. We know that. We understand that. We must be cautious of the language we use to talk about each other. It's an important part of our faith experience when we are a welcoming, hospitable, be-who-you-are kind of church. The readings remind us of that gift of hospitality and welcoming. They talk about who you are as a child of God, which is what happens when you're baptized. And then it takes a lifetime to figure it out and a lifetime to live what it means to be a child of God. Our society in this country right now is filled with tension and stress and fear and worry and anxiety, and looking over your shoulder, and wondering who to trust. And our communities being separated these last 15 weeks has not helped this situation. Our regular togetherness reassured us of our connection to each other, and how our support and kindness was expected from each other. I want to remind you that that support and kindness has not disappeared. Hold on to what you remember about our being together with each other. That will be restored when we return. And there will be lots of new conversations we're called to have. Don't be afraid to have the conversations you want to have when you come back to church. That is our only way to understand each other and to get through all of this. I mean, ask somebody how they are surviving the coronavirus. Ask somebody how they felt about the murder of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery or Rashard Brooks. Ask somebody, what do they think about Black Lives Matter? Now think about this. Black Lives Matter is not just a phrase, not just a banner, not just a political movement in our country. Black Lives Matter is saving lives. Recently, the Congressional Black Caucus released a report they've been working on for 26 years on the suicide of youth. And it says, black youth, 10 to 13 years of age, the suicide death rate among them is increasing faster than any other racial ethnic group. So when you say black lives matter, you're sending out a message to young black people that you count, you matter, 
you're important. We want to help you to grow up. We want to help you to become educated. We want to help you to be leaders. We want you to lead us. We want you to guide us. You're going to be in charge one day, and we want to support you and encourage you to become that person that God calls you to become, and we want to be a part of that. So Black Lives Matter is not just a sign and a brochure you'll hold up somehow. Black Lives Matter can be a saving grace to some young kids that are hearing a negative and seeing a negative attitude about them and can might change somebody's heart and soul around. So when you talk about Black Lives matter, you may be saving somebody's life without even knowing it. Those are the kind of questions we have to talk about with each other. Ask somebody what did they think about the days and weeks and months of protest. Ask somebody if their understanding or knowledge of racism has changed during this time. Ask parents with black children what it's like to have a black son or a black daughter. Do you feel free and confident to ask these kinds of questions? If you don't, look into yourself. If you do, you will learn, and you will grow, and you will have great, challenging, wonderful, insightful conversations. This is a very unique time when these questions have to be explored. Not explored by CNN or Fox News or MSNBC, but explored by us with our fellow parishioners who share life together during the year. That's what hospitality and welcoming and being who you are is all about, as the Gospel says. We can be our own source of inspiration, understanding, and learning. Because of the great mix of people, we have a chance that many parishes do not have to share these conversations with people very different from ourselves in a trusted, faithful atmosphere. We must take advantage of this opportunity. And we must ask ourselves if our faith is shaping our politics or if we are allowing our politics to shape our faith. Our faith must be the source and the center. This will help us develop right relationships in our community. Maybe we need a Truth and Reconciliation Council. South Africa had a Truth and Re Reconciliation Council to bring them out of apartheid. Rwanda had a Truth and Reconciliation Council to bring them through the genocide. Maybe in this nation, we need a Truth and Reconciliation Council on race. Maybe in this nation, we need a Truth and Reconciliation Council on LGBTQ plus relations. If we listen to South Africa, and if we listen to Rwanda through the Truth and Reconciliation Council, those African nations are teaching us that we don't want to listen to them. We consider South Africa, Rwanda, third world nations. We say, America, we're a first world nation. And we use that to keep ourselves from learning and understanding from somebody else what they have gone through, the heartache they've traveled, and what they have learned to teach us. We must learn to listen to other nations that we automatically dismiss and don't consider as important because they have great insight and wisdom about heal, healing from these terrible, tragic situations. We need to do that because our Truth and Reconciliation Council on Race or on LGBTQ relations would be an extremely important part of our national story and history. Jesus made these choices, so must we. And every time Jesus faced fear, he chose love over fear. And every time Jesus faced judgment, he chose mercy over judgment. And every time Jesus faced exclusive ex exclusivity, he chose inclusion over exclusion. That's what we are called to do as a hospitable, welcoming, be who you are kind of church. Brothers and sisters, this is our calling. It's a challenge. It's a change. We have to open our hearts and open our minds and open our spirits. But if we are going to step into the world the way it is today, we must be the church that allows hospitality, welcoming, and encouraging people to be who they are, to be the children of God, that we might celebrate, lift up, and encourage each one, each other, to be the great church of Jesus Christ that we know we are called to be and we know we can become. It's difficult, it's challenging, but it's possible, and that's our dream. Praise the Lord.